I don't remember what it was like for him to come home from the hospital, but my mom says that everyone knew that we came as a pair. Yeah, as we got older, yeah, we were like, you know, peas and carrots. He wanted to do everything and live to the fullest. You know, if you look back, it's almost kind of like somewhere in his brain he knew. Authorities say 22-year-old Kellen Roberts died Monday of severe brain injuries after he was attacked in Central Sioux Falls early Saturday morning. The cause of death has not yet been determined, but neighbors report seeing three men chasing Roberts down a nearby alley. Police say Roberts sustained injuries to the back of his head and was found unconscious after an anonymous 911 call. Kellen passed away in South Dakota. They were at a party and there was um, a kid being picked on and my brother, you know, sort of stood up for him and went and confronted the guy and, and the guy got mad at my brother. So my brother's friend said, hey, these are kind of small town guys, they're gonna gang up on you, you better go. So um, my brother was walking back and uh, a car pulls up. The guy in the back and the, the passenger got out and started to chase Callan. And um, so they're running through yards and alleys and um, we're just sort of coming at two different angles and collided and um, Kellen uh, hit the ground and didn't get up. I got a phone call from my mom basically saying, come to the airport right now. And on the way there, I came to the decision that we would just uh, take him home. In whatever state he was in, I wasn't going to not want him. And so when they said that that wasn't possible, it was like, what are you talking about? We can't take him home. Of course I can take him home. I'll just take care of him. And then they explained to you what brain death is. It was all about basically one thing, and that was baseball. My first word was ball, slept with my bat. I was being recruited by uh, big time schools, and I had tryouts with, with some pro teams. And then I, I basically woke up one morning and um, couldn't breathe. So at that point, we decided to go into the emergency department. They decided to do a, a chest x-ray and noticed my heart was extremely dilated, enlarged, and um, basically told me that I would need a new heart if I wanted to live. The 17-year-old Connor Rabinowitz was the star catcher for Edina High School and had a lifetime of baseball ahead of him. But now, his life and his dream depends on the generosity of a stranger. Connor has not left the hospital since mid-December. He is one of more than 3,000 people waiting for hearts in the country. You know, I want that heart now, you know. I... 20 kids in Connor's age group die each year waiting for hearts. Next thing I knew, um, I just crashed and I couldn't breathe. And a couple people came in with this mechanical pump and said, you know, we have this procedure we can do. We can, we can open you up and put this pump inside you that does the work for your heart. All I remember is looking at them and telling them, let's do it, let's do it right now. Just to, um, I could feel myself, I was, I was almost, I almost gone. Are you afraid of dying? Yeah. That's what scares me the most. My brother and I had talked about him being an organ donor. I clearly remember the day that he said, if anything happens to me, this is what I want you to do. I think that's why I was so 
you know, resolute in that decision. And this was just something I could do for him in that. The last thing I could do for him. So I had the pump surgery, slowly recovering from it. It was uh, March 7th, I believe, I woke up. My mom came in my room. Uh, she was on the phone and said, the heart's here. I just instantly got scared to leave this world and my family and friends. They were gonna cut out my heart and I didn't know if I was gonna wake up. I thought about um, whose heart it would be and I felt deep sadness. I knew that someone just, just died. I knew because I got this call that they decided to be an organ donor. I remember walking into the front door. My mom had a bunch of paperwork and I immediately knew what she was doing. And she just looked at me and, and said, do you want to know? Kind of, I think I remember walk, walking upstairs to my room and started reading about my donor. Seeing his picture felt at that time like, kind of like this was my brother that I, that I lost. I mean, bottom line, he, he saved not only my life, but so many others. And um, my parents both wrote letters. And shortly after I was re recovering, I, I wrote mine. They contacted us and said, do you want to receive a letter from the heart recipient's family? And, and we said, of course, like, bring it on. This is Connor's letter, and he began, Dearest friend, it's not every day that someone has to write a letter of this nature. I feel like my life has changed in so many ways since December 12th, when I went to the emergency room. I finally got word that a heart was available on March 8th. I realized that a 22-year-old young man had died for me to live. It hit me then that life is so unbelievable and precious. I'm only 17 years old, but I feel like I've grown up and matured in many ways. I put my hand on my chest every day and thank him for being so loving. I love you, Mrs. Roberts and Kellen, for your gift. It's an honor to have such an amazing heart. I am forever grateful. With so much love, Connor Guerin. I wanted, my mom wanted, to believe that this gift from my brother, this part of him, went to someone that did, would do him honor. It, it didn't take long for me to really, really want to come out and meet this family. So Connor and his mom came to Seattle and met us at um, a hotel at the Seattle waterfront. Um, I was just kind of pacing, just looking out onto the water and we were turning around and saw two women in the lobby and I, I knew immediately who they were. She opened up her arms and, and it was my donor's mom and, and we just started hugging. And um, I remember my mom hugging him for what seemed a ridiculous amount of time. I remember thinking how awesome it was that he didn't let her go. And I thought, he's going to hug her as long as she wants. Like, how awesome is that? I just remember holding on to Nancy and, um, and looking into Aaron's eyes and thinking, I am very attracted to her. Not intimate attraction, but a real real close connection just from locking eyes with her. I'd never felt anything like it before. Yeah, I, I didn't want to leave her side. So glad that he was brave enough to be here visiting us at that moment. If I were him, I would have been terrified. It would have, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to do the right thing? Am I going to be the right person for this, you know, this thing that they hold so dear, you know, this piece up there? their son and, and uh, brother. It was, that's brave and it was amazing to me, yeah. 
that weekend. We showed him around Seattle and just had a good time. Just got to know him. At the end of that weekend, um, we exchanged contact info, so we were able to stay in touch. I left that, that year in, in 2006, not really knowing what would happen. So, <clears throat> what happened next? And then he wanted to come out a year later and visit, and he did. And then uh, he came a couple times over the next few years. I was really clear that um, Connor was a good guy, but I think I still wanted to keep my distance. So then Connor called me in February 2011, and he just said, hey, can I come out? And I thought, oh, this is kind of out of the blue, but well, sure, sure, come out. It was a lot like all the other visits, except um, I was a little older, <laughs> and uh, I think it, it just felt a little more like um, there was a chance. It felt a little bit different. <laughs> and then he left, and I told my girlfriend, you know, I cannot stop thinking about him. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, nothing. You know, this is something I have to get over. Uh, so, you know, days go by, a week goes by, and I thought, oh my God, this is getting worse, not better. I wanted to pick up the phone and call him. I went home, and... Um... I think the next day I, I called her. She answered the phone and I said, I just need to tell you something. I have feelings for you. And since I was in the car with my mother, I didn't want to start this conversation. And so I said, okay, thanks for telling me. Uh, I'll call you later and just hung up. <laughs> so I called him when we got back and just said, um, I think I might too. So we decided this is a good time for you to come out and, and see my hometown, and um, so she did. And the truth is, the tension was building. Like, it was thick. You could cut it. You could see it. And then at the end of the night, we got in the car and went back to his apartment, and he closed the door, and... <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty good. <laughs> The day it came for me to go, we were just sort of laying on his couch and I just started to cry and I didn't stop. At that point I was figuring out, is this this thing, this beautiful moment that's going to be gone? Because how could we make it work? So I just knew it was going to be difficult. She kind of stammered and stuttered a little bit, so then she tells me that, well, um, Connor and I are like kind of together. Good thing she was talking a lot because I was really speechless and finally I said, well, that's a lot to take in. I thought we have Connor and his family and we're grateful that Kel found such a good person for his heart, he takes such good care and that there's a lot of emotions around all of this and if they're misplaced and this doesn't work, we, Aaron would have to lose Kel again. It'd be very hard on Connor and everybody. I mean, the stakes were higher. I mean, no breakup is good, but we have this tie to him forever and didn't want to throw a wrench in that. I knew my mom would have a hard time believing it was real. So I gave myself time and I, I thought, could I be doing this for these other reasons? Could that be possible? And I, I didn't think about it long because I thought, no way. 
you know, I, I don't want to live without him. It was a desire that I felt was going to happen regardless of what anyone told me. I definitely respected those <laughs> thoughts um, and I understood why they felt that way, but um, it was going to happen. And after I finished school, I ended up moving out here. It was different. I mean, I didn't really know what would happen. It was scary, but I always knew that these feelings would only get stronger. And ever since I moved out here in, in March of 2012, I have only gotten to love her more. It took me three years to really digest this internally. Over time, I have come to trust how absolutely solid as a rock he is. But I did think, they're going to do this. They are so committed, so I will commit to, so that I could wholeheartedly get on board, you know. <laughs> no pun intended. But there's a lot of heart in the whole thing, no matter how you look at it. Last April, Connor's family came for Passover, and um, so we got on the ferry, and Connor suggested, why don't we go outside? It was a beautiful day. Connor just put his arm around me and started telling me how much he loved me and talking a little too much, which is when I knew something was up. <laughs> and then he got down on his knee and, and asked me to abuse him forever. Sometimes I could hear it sitting next to him on the couch. And I said, is this normal? Is it always so loud? And he said, that's just the way it is. They told me it's a really, really strong beat. A lot of feelings and a lot of emotions just with everything that's happened over the past decade. I um, wake up every morning and I just feel more, more thankful and grateful and just um, appreciative of this gift that was given. I think Kellen had a master plan. He couldn't control, obviously, what he was doing, but he decided to be an organ donor. And the connection that I have with Aaron, the closeness that I feel, um, is, I mean, it's because of Kellen. So when someone passes, you don't get answers. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they thought. You don't know these things. You have to make them up for your own self. You have to choose your own beliefs. So my brother wanted so much in life to make sure that I was taken care of, that if there was any way he could, I believe that he chose Connor for me. Critical care, Connor. <laughs> 